And in the very short amount of time that we have, 30 minutes to do, that I have, uh, to talk a little bit about what compassion could be as a felt sense, as an existential reality in the here and now, as an energy. Which is not quite the same as an action or an appearance or an activity. It's not quite the same as even a direction. And what on earth could this very holy thing we call compassion, what could that be about? And what's our relationship with this part of ourselves? Because we all have a relationship with this area of compassion. It can be a relationship of deficiency, of poverty, like we feel there's not enough compassion in our lives coming towards us. We feel very much left alone, that it's not a compassionate world, that humans lack compassion. It can be a relationship of self-sacrifice and obligation, where we feel we have to be compassionate or else. And of course, there'll be a unique area where we each fill in our worst condemnation there, or else we will be rejected. We have to be compassionate or else we won't belong. We have to be compassionate or else we will betray our purpose. We have to be compassionate or else we will be bad. We will be whatever that awful thing is, which is uncompassionate, lacking in compassion. So we have to be compassionate. We have to make ourselves compassionate by doing good stuff, by behaving in the right way, by thinking the right thoughts and feeling the right feelings, having the right physical sensations. Oi, oi, oi. That's a lot we have to control all at once in order to not be bad, in order to be compassionate. And the problem with this compassion complex, this area where the relationship that we have with compassion might be a little bit complicated or self-sacrificing or resentful, or maybe just dead, just numb. This area where we have a complicated relationship with compassion is in a way awakening us. When we give it space of awareness, it's awakening us to become a little bit more attuned to what on earth this compassion deal is. Is it an ethic? Is it a moral? Is it a social contract? Is it a strategy to be popular, to be loved? What is it? What is it really? What is compassion in its purity? So today I'm not sure we can talk about compassion in its purity. For that, you have to come to the three-day workshop, which is happening on Friday <laughs> on purity in the American time zone. You can find it on the website. But we can talk about compassion in the commonplace, the commonality, the common sense of compassion. Notice I'm using the word com a lot. Com is all about togetherness, communication, communion, common sense. In the commonplace, in our normal, regular, relaxed, real life. In the real thing, not in the spiritual 
zone where we are holy and we're white. No, no, no. On the toilet in the morning when we wake up and we don't feel like living and we have to make coffee for our beloved. In the commonplace, in the little nitty gritty details of being alive at the supermarket, in the traffic jam. This kind of compassion. So what's so beautiful about the word compassion with the com in it, communication, communion, is also the word compass, compass. When you look at a compass, like we saw spinning at the entry screen, there's a wheel with polarities, north, south, east, west. We all have a compass. I think God's in the north. The devil's in the south. (laughs) The losers are in the east and the winners are in the west. (laughs) The women are in the east, the men are in the west. The men are above, the women are below. Unless you want to spin the polarity and then everything can switch, which is fun. But a compass, there's a compass inside the word compassion. And a compass gives us direction and a compass, if that's the compass of karma, spinning, life, creation, experience, our actual lives, then compassion would be that point at the center of the compass. That place which is perfectly still, perfectly alive, that essence of true nature. full of everything and nothing. It will be at the center point, the center point maybe of being. And when we are here in an easy, relaxed way as the center point, without grasping an aversion towards the east or the west or the north or the south, our direction becomes free the compass of need, the compass of care, the compass of love, the compass of peace, the compass of wisdom, the compass even of right action, which happens by itself out of the center point. Meaning if you're strong and yet another one's weak and you're climbing up a mountain, you can give a hand to pull them up. The hand moves by itself because the body is very compassionate to help the other one pull up. And when you sit down and you can't remember something and they have a genius mind, by themselves they will fill in the gaps for you. Spontaneous compassion. Mutual cooperation, interdependency, togetherness. Happening by itself because we are not separate. Not because we want to be loved or because we have to be seen as a good person or because we want to be good and not bad, but just spontaneously happening from a a deep center point. So this is beautiful, but and so simple, but not easy, is it? Because in regular life, we often lose the center. We get taken out of our center point. And sometimes we find ourselves so far out from the center, we're out there in a wilderness and the compass is gone and we don't know north from south and east from west and we don't even remember where we're going. And maybe for some of us, we don't even remember that we're lost. And it's not that we did something wrong to get lost. We're just born into it. We're born into this place of finding the compass hardwired to be lost, hardwired to find our way home, to find the center point on the inside again. So where do we most, if we break it down to the commonplace, to the little daily life, commonality, where do we most lose ourselves? 
that center connection? Where do we get lost? Where does the body get lost from its equilibrium, from its natural sense of balance? Where do we lose the sense of freedom of movement and space? Where do we lose the sense of wholeness? We could say, yeah, it's because of the mind. Yeah, we always blame the mind, don't we? It's because of our conditioning. It's, you know, it's that damn mind again. It's because we have a, a brain. It's because of bad thinking. Oh, dear, we've got bad again. Where do we get lost? We get lost in our thoughts, for sure. But why do we get lost in our thoughts, in the wilderness, in the forest of our thoughts? Partly because something has thrown us out of the area of feeling or the area of physical sensation. It is quite an ejection when we get lost in our thoughts. There's something quite raw and real which we're conflicting with, which mustn't be there, which makes us think a lot. For example, a flash of anger at the wrong time and the wrong place, a feeling of rage, a feeling of screw the world. Let the world go to hell. For example, and if that happens in the middle of a very holy environment, so we're surrounded by people who all look very holy and we're all being very compassionate, that's kind of, it's not really okay, is it, to have that anger arising. Anger is bad. Anger's not welcome. But the anger already happened. It already arose. Out of the body, what happens with anger? First of all, that something goes, whoosh, like something is touched, something very real, like a whoosh. And then our mouth goes dry. And then our hands get clammy. And there's a bit of a shaking because we don't want to let it come through. Because if we let anger express or move, then we might be aggressive or rude or hurt somebody else. And that's not okay, because then we'll be bad, bad, bad. So anger is bad just when it shows up. And it shows up as a physiology. And part of this trembling and this hot, cold, hot, cold, this, <gasps> this don't breathe anymore feeling of anger is not even anger. It's anger which is made bad, which is not allowed to be alive. Anger where we, with, as a feeling which, for which we have no compassion at all. We have no space. Compassion is acknowledging what is here, giving it space and time from a center point. Oh, there is an experience of anger arising. It's here. We lose our compassion when we say, oh, that's not here. That can't be here. I'm not feeling that. That's not okay. And I'm bad. This is where we lose our compassion. So we have a compassion knot right there, a compassion contraction right there because we are physically alive. So we can try and think peaceful thoughts and think caring, loving thoughts and think non-confrontational thoughts and think about anything but what's happening physically in our bodies when we're angry. But that's where we get that thinking, 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 thinking. And after a while, this thinking becomes a kind of self-justification. Like, I'm angry because. I'm angry because of the other one. I'm not angry because I'm angry. I'm not angry because there's been a lack of space, because there's been a shock, because there's been something exposed which wasn't ready to be exposed. I'm not angry because I lost my boundary. I'm angry because of the neighbor's dog. It's not because 10 years ago I was in Beirut and I saw my friends killed by enemy fire, so-called enemy fire. That's not the reason I'm angry. And the reason I can't sleep at night? No, it's the neighbor's dog barking. That's the reason I'm angry. I am alive physically because of the neighbor's dog. 
My boundary arises thanks to the neighbor's dog. The neighbor's dog has power over my whole instinctive physical humanity. It's a lucky dog. This is what the thoughts are doing in their panic because anger is bad to feel because if you are angry, you are not compassionate. You're a bad person. Anger equals bad. So it's bad to feel angry. And it's you get angry that we feel bad to feel angry that we're bad because we're angry people and we have a bad issue with anger. So now there's a badness with the anger. Anger feels horrible. Anger feels unbearable. It's like an illness moving through us. It's such a, it becomes such a suffering. And a suffering which creates, perpetuates itself because it's not allowed to feel bad when we're angry. That's why we don't want to feel angry because we don't want to feel bad. But then we've noticed that we feel angry anyway and, and, and we feel even more bad. And it's badness with the power of anger moving through it. Empowered badness, rageful badness. Oh, this is beginning to look rather evil. Yo, <laughs> that's really not okay. Tricky. And we might hurt somebody. And if it goes on like this without compassion, we, we probably will will explode at a certain moment. Because the badness has to be with the other one. It has to be with the world. It has to be with the government. Let's go have a riot. Oh, God, it feels good to fight a war, to release it in a justifiable, good way, a purposeful war, a compassionate war. <laughs> Organized release of this inner voltage of violence. Yay. Let's join the army and kill somebody. Therapy for this anger, which is not here because I will harm people and I will be bad. It's tricky. It's really tricky because anger is such a natural part of our humanness, of our animalness, of our instinctive nature. It's how we say, no, closer, don't touch me there. Don't come into this territory right now. I don't want to deliver myself right now. I need space. I need a little bit of time. Even if we're saying that to ourselves, the anger comes forward. It's asking for some space and it's literally common sense space. Space around the body. Space to breathe. I need time. Commonplace time. Even if it's toilet break, I'm going to the toilet now. <coughs> Two minutes of time alone in the toilet, time to breathe, to reset, <coughs> to feel my aliveness, to feel, to find my center again. That center where I can respect this energy that's moving through my physical body and let it move, let it make the mouth dry, let the mouth wet on itself again, let it make the body hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, let the body regulate itself. Poor body needs a bit of space and time for that. Let the poor mind have a little bit of space and time to say, okay, this is not because of the dog. This is because I'm triggered by something which, in which I really felt violated maybe in the past, maybe in the present, and something in me feels so humiliated, so hurt, so intruded. So let's go to that place with compassion, because the moment we take a little bit of time and space, we the compassion is there. Where we are aware the compassion is there. Where we attend to where we have been wounded, destabilized, where we lost our center. The compass shows up. The compass shows up with a direction which is empowered. <clears throat> and then we don't need to go and uh, scream at the neighbor. We don't need to hurt anybody else because now it's not about hurting. It's about compassion. It's about being there, honoring what is here in the commonplace, what is felt. And of course, when we are able to honor the physiology of anger, the voltage of anger as it moves through ourselves, we also suddenly find there's a space and time available for the anger that shows up 
in our friend, in our beloved, in our children, in our parents, in our community. <coughs> now there's an interesting thing which happens because of this badness, as we lost our compassion for those places where we feel bad. Where we feel bad, meaning we feel unwell, we lost our compassion because we believe that badness is a thing, that to be bad is a verdict. It's like to be guilty, to be thrown away, to be locked up, to be punished, to be excluded. But no, to be bad is to feel bad, it's to feel rotten, to feel like crap, to feel unwell, <coughs> to feel in need. And surely, those times where we're feeling most lousy, where we're feeling horrible, is the times that we most need this energy of compassion. It's all we do is move from it being a thought, a judgment, you're bad, to a feeling, I'm feeling bad right now. My chest is feeling bad. My nerve system's feeling bad. My knees are feeling bad. My, my bones are feeling bad. So compassion doesn't make us Ex exiled from humanity that we feel bad sometimes, that we suffer. So it becomes a healing game, a healing bounce when we can move to the center point and we bring compassion because then we get out of this cycle of suffering perpetuating suffer and anger perpetuating anger and harm perpetuating harm to something else where it, there is something much more like a pandemic of compassion. Compassion per perpetuating compassion. Somebody who can stay in their center and contain the anger of another is perpetuating compassion. Someone who can stay in their center without bending or pleasing or running because of the threat of the anger of another. Meaning who can stay in their own truth in alignment with their own sense of what feels right is also perpetuating compassion. And this is just the outer, the outer defense system of our physical evolution, of our physical survival, anger. It's the fight response or the freeze response, when something feels very dangerous. That's all it is. And at best it's free for actual physical survival as opposed to emotional survival or egoic survival or the survival of my status or the survival of how I appear in the world. But it's about survival. And the more we get back to the physiology of it, the more it can be free to help us survive in a compassionate way. Compassion is born of preservation. Sorry, anger is born of the desire to preserve the form. The interesting thing happens when we walk our dog and she gets a shock from another dog or from a person, a jogger, or what we often find in nature is there are these men in wetsuits on bicycles, middle-aged men who are going zoomf, through nature very, very fast, and they're not looking where they're going, so the dog gets this fright, and her fur bristles up, and she goes, yeah, and she attacks. She doesn't attack, but she, she makes rage sounds, because she's afraid, because they almost run her over, because she's terrified, and all her fur is standing up, bristled, And she moves through it very quickly, much quicker than humans. Her body, her system is very natural. It regulates very easily, but it's very clear to see that the underside of anger is fear. That fear is part of anger and anger is part of fear. And fear is also a kind of early warning system when there is danger to the form. Or when there's something coming towards an area of pain where it's too vulnerable to contain right now where there's a need for some space, some protection, some time. Fear is also, it's a kind of sensitivity in its naturalness, a kind of blissful awakeness. But again, because it's not good to be fearful and because our fears seem irrational, our fears don't make sense. We so often lose compassion for this physiology of fear. And again, it's a physical body thing. It's part of our naturalness. 
It's part of the commonplace. And it's not just a thought, oh, I'm fearful, let's not feel it, and that's it. How do I get rid of this fear as soon as possible? It's a whole adventure. What on earth is this fear? How is it moving through your physical body when you're afraid? Which we all are and we always will be because we are alive. Because it's part of our system. So there are many kinds of fear. There is the fear which is moving from bottom up, from south to north. <laughs> like associated with shock. And there's the fear which is like, whoop, like the, fall, the floor falls out and we go, bump. The falling fear, like, oh, my God. I'm coming to that place which must never be felt deep inside the pelvic area. I'm going down. There is the fear which is very much playing out horizontally <laughs> towards other people when they look at us with that look or this look. Fear of social feedback which could turn into a lynch, maybe has done in the past to us or our ancestors, or could turn into a sudden exclusion or a sudden rejection. So there's a fear going horizontally. There's fear in so many directions and within so many relationships, there is a movement of fear with the uniqueness of how it moves. But that fear also, if we make it bad, we break connection. We break connection with the very thing that fear is wanting us to sense. So we become even more unsafe. Because now we don't know what we're afraid of. And then for after a while, it seems we're just afraid of the fear. Because it's not okay to feel fear. So we break the connection with that Okay, does she is she rejecting me or is she not rejecting me? Stay in connection. The fear is, is sensing, very, very, very awake, very, very sensing. But if we're not allowed to be afraid or to be concerned or to be nervous or to be delicate or to be refined or to be alive, we can't give it space and time. If we can't stay, if we lose the compass, then it's like we block the other person. They freak me out. They're fearful. Something in their energy. But then where we block our perception, where we block our, our natural connectivity, the connectivity, the communication, the communion, which is always there, when we block it, we also block part of our survival responses. So we actually are more insecure. We don't really know where we are. We lose our team. We lose our map. So now the monster can come out of the darkness, can get us from behind because we're not allowed to be Awake in the sensitivity, but when it's bad, when it's unpleasant. So again, we lose part of our, of our naturalness, of the beautiful um, aliveness. We lose compassion for our humanness, our animalness. Our, we lose compassion for, for, for our experiential uh, abilities. We lose compassion for our consciousness, actually, because fear is very awake. So blocking it, we have to reduce consciousness. So now consciousness is bad news. Oh, my God, I'm so self-conscious. We split from our own consciousness. We split it up. And, of course, these two can easily dance together. And when they start to get dance together, anger and fear, when the waltz begins, it spins off into that forest and takes us with it potentially big and we really can lose the compass because we become afraid that we're afraid and we're really angry that we're afraid that we're afraid and we're afraid that we're going to get even more angry and that makes us angry that we're afraid and all the time the mind is racing 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 trying to sort this out better be afraid for some of us it's better to be afraid i'm so afraid but i'm so secretly angry but if I'm afraid, then at least I'm the victim. I'm the good one. I'm not bad. I'm the fearful one. So nobody's going to lock me up or punish me or hit me. or Because it's not my fault. I'm so afraid. I'm like a child. I'm just afraid. I'm just afraid. I'm just afraid. Safe coping strategy. So sometimes anger shows up with a face of fear. And on the other side, 
if you're a real man, mm -hmm. that cyclist in the wetsuit, you don't call it a wetsuit, do you? You call it something else in his cyclist gear. He's never afraid. He's been to Beirut. No fear. He's got a bumper sticker on the back of his car that says, no fear. So all he's got is anger. So when he feels insecure or frightened or fearful, he mans it up. Get out of my way. At least you could learn to park. Keep your dog under control. He processes the shock in a tilt. The dog almost ripped his leg off. And now he's telling me to like, do something with my dog. <laughs> the man is terrified. He's a chicken. <laughs> totally afraid. But he can only be angry. He can only be angry because he is a man. And it's so sad as well. Because those, that kind of pattern often leads to this shame-based, fearful, split-off, intensely lonely panic attacks that's hit in the middle of the night of fear that wants to show up, of a voltage that wants to release that's never been allowed to release because he lost all compassion for the fearful side in himself. And not by choice, probably because he was a man. As a little boy, he wasn't allowed to be afraid. When he came home from kindergarten and said, mommy, they're bullying me at school. I don't want to go back. Don't make me go back. It's like, go and stand up for yourself. Stand for yourself. His sister can be afraid, but he has to be strong for both of them. So compassion was lost for this place of fear, which means that he disconnected, which means he doesn't see the dog, which means he doesn't see me, which means he's harming people all over the place, which makes him feel even more alone and even more afraid and even more lost. And he's not allowed to feel lost. He's not allowed to feel lonely. He's not allowed to be weak. So I hope you begin to get a sense of the connection between the center point of compassion and this natural, instinctive, beautiful energies, physiological energies. They're physiological energies of anger and fear. They're physiological because they're moving through the blood. They're moving through the temperature regulation. They're moving through the nerve system. They're affecting our thoughts. These are physiological gifts like breathing and eating and digestion, which are here to support us in our humanness, in our togetherness. They are energy sources, vitality sources, which are all about celebrating life. About organizing space and time, about finding honor, about finding compassion. And yet, which so tragically get, have the, we in our learning cycle, get confused into being this mind-blowing, messy, uh, nightmarish entanglements where in the end, all we have is a brain fog, because that's the only way we can numb the mind, a kind of sense of dullness in the heart, because that's the only way we can protect ourselves, because we don't know where the danger is coming from, and a sense of like bellyache and incredible unrest and uneasiness in the basis of the body, in the colon, because that's the only way we can deal with the voltage there, which is somehow not free to move through the system. And all it takes is to find that compass, the center point, to change our attitude towards our own experience, towards our own emotions, to play with the possibility of having a compassionate attitude, which means to give them a little bit of time, a little bit of space, a little bit of breath, a little bit of oxygen, to take a few moments just with the in-breath, finding the compass and letting the weather be the weather. It will organize itself. It will find its own naturalness. <laughs> 